so what I would like to do is try to uh, convey a, a few uh, of our experiences in using uh, next generation sequencing approaches to try to find the mutations that cause disease. But instead of just sharing the genetic results, what I'd like to do is put, put forward the somewhat um, provocative proposition uh, that in a way we are getting too good at doing the genetics and that we are in fact not really prepared for the successes that we are already having and will continue to have in really being able to systematically track down the causes of, uh, of, of human diseases. So to begin, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you about some of our work uh, as part of a, a consortium called Epi4K. Uh, this is a so-called center without walls uh, that was funded by the NINDS in the NIH beginning uh, about uh, four years ago. And within Epi4K, there are several different uh, project areas, and I'll be telling you t today about one of the project areas, which is uh, uh, looking at the genetics of epileptic encephalopathies. Now, Epi4K as a whole is run by Dan Lowenstein at UCSF, uh, Sam Berkovic at the University of Melbourne, and myself. And the folks at Duke that have been working on Epi4K are uh, pictured and named uh, on the screen. The, the two epileptic encephalopathies that we have focused attention on can be thought of as classical epileptic encephalopathies. They're called infantile spasms and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. I won't say much about the clinical details here because that's not the focus, uh, but just to give you a feeling of what we're studying, uh, these are both very bad epilepsies to have. Uh, they begin early in life, and they are associated uh, with uh, a variety of developmental difficulties that can often be quite severe, and especially in the case of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, the prognosis is, 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 is not good. Now, when we initiated uh, our work, it was already known that uh, epileptic encephalopathies are influenced by de novo mutations in a handful of genes already connected to epileptic encephalopathies. And so what we decided to do is sequence uh, probands and also their parents uh, using whole exome sequencing and identify all the de novo mutations uh, that are present in the exome and then uh, deploy a variety of statistical approaches to ask whether we have any good evidence that any of those de novo mutations really are causing disease. And what's shown here are the number of probands studied that have different numbers of de novo mutations observed in the, the exome. And so, for example, we see around 100 of the individuals that we studied without any de novo mutations in the exome at all, a similar number that have just one, and so on. And in fact, we see an average of approximately one de novo mutation per exome, which is consistent with what other people have seen. Now, I'm not going to go into the technical details of, of actually identifying and validating these de novo mutations. What I do want to say is that this, in fact, works very well. There are some technical details you need to go through to get it right you certainly still need to Sanger validate all the candidate de novo mutations that emerge from the next generation sequencing. But this does work, and you can end up with what are most certainly definitively real de novo mutations. And we also know, because we've done a variety of things to convince ourselves, that we are in fact catching most of the de novo mutations that are present in the exome. And, and that really is a remarkable new ability, and it's one of the reasons why genetics is progressing so fast now. Um, that there really would not have been many people that shortly after the Human Genome Project completed would have predicted that about 10 years later we would be able to take any genome that we want as long as we have parents and find all the brand new mutations and do that in a, in a matter of days. And that, that really is more than anything, I think, the, the reason that genetics is changing so much. In any event, this is what we got out of the um, 356 trios that we looked at at this stage. And this is a, a, a visual illustration of the results of the study. And what's being shown here is on the x-axis, 
a, an estimate of the total mutability of genes. So this is reflecting gene size, but also the sequence-specific mutation rate for genes. On the y-axis is the number of de novo mutations observed, and the heat map representation that is shown here gives a reflection of the significance of, of observing a particular number of de novo mutations in a particular gene with a given size and mutability. And the point of showing the results this way is to emphasize that you can't think about the significance of the findings without considering the mutability of the gene. And the basic idea here is that if you sequence 350 trios, let's say, um, if you have a really big, really mutable gene, it may not be at all surprising to see two or three de novo mutations in your entire data set. And therefore, you cannot use the observation of recurrent mutation in your data set to declare that there is evidence that those mutations are influencing risk. And a really simple way to see that is virtually everyone doing these kinds of studies now finds multiple mutations in Titan, a point we all like to make, without any of us claiming that Titan is influencing this condition or, or the other. So this uh, 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 figure just illustrates that idea and also illustrates where significance is in our particular study. So in our study, uh, we, we have uh, indicated where significance is with the red line. Any of the genes that are above that line, so that is a sufficient number of de novo mutations for the mutability of the gene, are actually significant in our data. And so you can see that SCN1A is significant, uh, DNM1 is significant. Um, that is a newly implicated gene. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, more about it in a moment um, that was identified using um, data from both not only Epi4K but also a uh, other con a different consortium called Euroepinomics, and we came together um, uh, in a in a, a group that's uh, about to report its findings in the American Journal of Human Genetics, and we also see significance for SCX uh, BP1 and GABA RB3. A number of the genes that are below that red line, we have very strong reason to believe, are also influencing epileptic encephalopathies, but in the current sample size, do not show significance. So when we look at all of the mutations that we believe have strong statistical evidence supporting their role in risk of epileptic encephalopathies, what we find is that 12% of patients can be genetically explained by a de novo mutation. Now, that is, of course, only a minority of patients, but if you think about it for a minute, this is really a striking claim because what it is actually telling us is that for these two serious kinds of epilepsy, one out of every 10 patients that come into the clinic could be genetically resolved if we actually do the genetics. And we are only just getting started. So we've looked at a few hundred patients so far, and we now know with strong confidence that we can explain one out of 10. We will obviously, we and others, will increase the sample size, and it is clear to all of us that specifically in epileptic encephalopathies, we are moving towards a situation in which a sizable fraction and maybe even a majority of patients that come up, come into the clinic will in fact be genetically explained. And I'll say more about why that's so important in a little bit. But right now, the point I want to emphasize is that one concern that a lot of us ha have had about the direction of human genetics is that it's becoming increasingly clear that in many therapeutic er areas, relatively rare uh, uh, variants are important uh, contributors to disease. And in fact, it, in many cases, they're very, very rare. And that is certainly what we see in epileptic encephalopathies. And so what that means is that at the level of underlying causal mutations, almost every patient has a different underlying genetic condition. Uh, we don't find that many patients that have disease because of the same um, gene and certainly not the same mutation. And so that raises significant challenges uh, in terms of how we think about organizing patients into groups that are relevant to treatment and also figuring out what to concentrate on in terms of drug development. If every patient is different, it's very, very difficult to think about rolling out precision or personalized medicine programs. Fortunately, when we look at the different mutations, it is very, very clear that we can organize them 
into affected biological pathways. And so while every patient might be different at the level of the underlying genetic mutation, there are clearly groups of patients that have the same biological pathway or process affected. And so just a couple of illustrations of that in our own data, eight out of the 356 patients have mutations that affect uh, GABA, receptor, um, GABA receptors, uh, which are the receptors for the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, and 12 out of the 356 patients have mutations that we feel can be quite securely connected to synaptic vesicle trafficking. So these uh, results are identifying groups of patients with quite distinct underlying biology. So here's uh, a, a, a couple of figures showing the mutations that we observe that we feel can be connected to synaptic vesicle trafficking, uh, some in the newly implicated uh, DNM1 gene, and uh, some in the already known uh, SDX BP1 gene. Uh, DNM1 is well known to be involved in endocytosis uh, of, of synaptic uh, vesicles, bringing them back in, in, into the cell, and S SDXBP1 involved in exocytosis. Um, here's just a, a graph, a, a figure illustrating uh, the function of uh, DNM1 uh, in uh, endocytosis, and, uh, and here uh, a figure showing where our um, uh, mutations are found in uh, representations of the structure of the, uh, of the DNM1 protein. And this next um, graph shows uh, how we can try to connect these uh, mutations to synaptic vesicle trafficking indirectly through endocytosis. So this is showing the uh, results of, of the work of uh, Ryan Dehinsa, a, an undergraduate uh, in the group. And what he did is um, transfect these mutations into cost cells and using a transferrin uptake assay asked how these mutations affect endocytosis, and the result is that they have a dramatic impact on transferrin uptake, indicating a dramatic impact on endocytosis. In fact, we have some data um, suggesting that these mutations are acting in a dominant negative way, so really having a dramatic impact on endocytosis. And other data from a mouse DNM1 model um, suggests that the endocytosis defect that these mutations cause does, in fact, have a synaptic vesicle effect because you see aberrant um, synaptic vesicles in terms of number and size in this mouse model. So what are the implications? Um, all three of the mutations uh, that we've studied for DNM1 do affect endocytosis. Um, we believe that this can, therefore, show that there is a synaptic vesicle trafficking dysfunction in epilepsy. And um, that can be, uh, therefore, a focus of uh, development of new therapies in epilepsy. Uh, these and other results uh, have really been so encouraging to a lot of us that a lot of us have been thinking about the development of what you could consider as bioinformatic signatures of mutations that actually do cause disease. Now, what we did before is show a statistical excess of any kind of mutation in the exome of patients um, that have a particular condition. Uh, what we want to do here is take mutations as a group um, and ask whether those found in patients of certain kinds are different from those found in controls so that we can get pointers to the mutations that cause disease even if we don't have a cohort where we have clear statistical excess in an individual gene. <clears throat> and how have we have been thinking about doing this is by combining uh, so-called uh, variant-level prioritization schemes with gene-level schemes. So the basic idea here is that there are many well-known approaches for asking whether a particular variant is expected to really change the function of a protein, the best known approach probably being polyphen. And all that is doing is, is seeking to ask the question, does the variant change the protein function? Uh, the higher the polyphen score, the more likely uh, it is uh, that the variant changes function. Um, but what we want to do is combine that with an assessment of whether a mutation in a gene actually matters, whether it actually is expected to do something to the person. And to get at that, we use 
a, a relatively new framework, um, which we refer to as an intolerance score. There's an analogous approach that Mark Daly's group has developed, and they refer to it as a constraint score. Um, these are two independent approaches that get in at the same thing. And what these scores do is simply assess whether variation in the gene that's functional appears to be under purifying selection in the human population. And genes that are, are, are under purifying selection, you can then reasonably infer that a bad mutation in such a gene is more likely to influence disease. The basic idea of the intolerance score is indicated here. Um, this is uh, taken from a figure it, from our PLOS genetics paper that uh, Slave Petrovsky and the group led. And what we show here is just the way we define the intolerance score for every gene in the genome. Every gene in the genome has a, pl a, a point on this plot. On the x-axis, we are simply counting up the number of variants observed in each gene, nothing more than that. Uh, and these data are taken from the Exome Variant Server Database, the NHBLI Exome Sequencing Project. And on the y-axis, what we show is the number of common functional variants in the gene, where common is defined as a frequency above 0.1%. And so the basic idea here is that what we're going to do is set up a regression framework where we use the total number of variants to estimate the number of common functional variants. And then those genes that have fewer common functional variants than you would predict based on their total variation, those genes we're going to infer are likely to be under purifying selection and we're more interested in mutations in those genes. Um, what we've highlighted in this figure are the genes that are at the extremes in terms of deviation from the predicted relationship. The ones in red have many fewer um, common functional variants than you would expect, and the ones in blue have more. And so the ones in red are the ones that we refer to as intolerant genes. And one point that I really want to emphasize here so that people have a feeling of how this actually works, um, this is truly informative about what's happening in, in individual genomes. I could take genes that are amongst the most intolerant using this scoring system based on variation that's observed in the human population, and I could predict that there are genes where if everyone who's on this, uh, listening to this webinar right now agreed to be sequenced, I could pick genes and say quite confidently, we're not going to see any missense variants because I know that they're not there. They're strongly selected against. And I could pick other genes in the blue group where I could say, you know, we sequence everybody listening, we're going to find stop mutations and, and many, many damaging missense mutations. And so what this is telling us is that this is definitively relevant to interpreting individual genomes when we sequence them. So what we did is integrate that um, gene level score along with the variant level score. And we actually drew in one other piece of information about genes, and that is whether they are uh, essential in the mouse. So that is um, when you knock them out completely. Um, does the mouse die? And if so, then they're considered essential. And we then asked, considering damaging mutations, whether the gene is essential or not, um, what its intolerance score is, we asked what percentage of controls, people without a diagnosis, have the worst mutations considering all of those criteria. So that is damaging at the variant level, intolerant in terms of the genic intolerance score, and essential in the mouse. And what we found is that only 1.9 percent, so around 2 percent of people that do not have a diagnosis um, have such mutations. So these mutations don't occur that often, specifically mutations with exactly these bioinformatic signatures. Now, of course, you know where this is headed. We then ask the question, what happens when we look at patients with disease? But now we ask it not in sort of the usual way, which is all patients with a certain disease, but we ask it in an actually tougher way. We ask what happens when you look in a heterogeneous population simply of patients that come in to a genetics clinic because there is a judgment that they have some kind of genetic condition, but you don't know what it is. And the majority of these patients are, in fact, classified as undiagnosed disease, 
which is, of course, a, a major focus of sequencing efforts right now. Uh, but some of them are what we internally refer to as unresolved. Um, so those are patients that do get a, a, a medical diagnosis, so a syndrome name is applied to what they have, uh, but either the gene for that syndrome is not known or the right gene doesn't appear to have anything in it. And so we looked at those kinds of patients, but otherwise uh, not uh, grouped in any, in any way. And we asked, how often do they have exactly those kinds of mutations that I just described? Um, de novo mutations in an essential gene in the mouse um, that is intolerant, using the intolerant scoring system. And now we find that 15% of the mutations have such, uh, of the individuals have such mutations. So we went from 2% in controls to 15% in this clinical population. Now this is a very dramatic um, observation, and the reason that it's so dramatic is that it is telling you that in this clinical population anyway, when you see one of these mutations, even if it is in a gene that has not ever before been connected to disease, it is probably contributing to disease because the majority of these mutations are, in fact, contributing to disease because there is such a dramatic elevation in these types of mutations in these patients compared to controls. So this is actually telling us that we are getting pretty good at so-called N equals 1 genomic studies. I do want to emphasize pretty good. It does not tell you that you know for sure that you have the disease-causing mutation or contributing mutation, but you do have a good candidate. <clears throat> this is a picture of Bertrand, of course, used with permission, and I include this just to try to convince you uh, that fundamentally what I'm saying is right. We really can look at uh, individual genomes, and if we look at them hard and we are careful, we can often come up with candidate explanations of disease, even in genes that had, at that point, not been implicated before in disease. So Bertrand uh, had, for many years, um, been screened for genes that cause congenital disorders of glycosylation. His clinical presentation was consistent with, with such uh, disorders, with one unusual feature, uh, which is that when Bertrand cries, he doesn't make tears. When we sequenced uh, Bertrand a few years ago, in the very early stages of our own diagnostic efforts here at Duke, we found that he is a compound heterozygote for apparent knockout mutations in N-glycanase, which, as I indicated, had not been before associated with disease, but it is clearly related to the genes that Bertrand had been tested for in that the genes that cause congenital disorders of glycosylation um, are involved in the pathway of putting glycans onto proteins, and N-glycanase is involved in pulling them back off so that when a protein is misfolded, it can more efficiently be degraded. For a variety of reasons, including the fact that knockout mutations never occur together in controls in this gene, including the fact that there were biochemical signatures uh, consistent with the idea that this gene was responsible for disease, for a variety of reasons, even though this was a really classical N equals 1 uh, genomic study in the sense that we were suggesting a brand new syndrome based on looking at one single patient. For a variety of reasons, we came to the view it was probably responsible, and we, in fact, decided to communicate that information to Bertrand's family. Uh, in retrospect, I'm very happy that we did that, even though we actually went through a long process to decide whether or not it, it was appropriate to do. And I'm happy that we did that because not only did we get it right, um, but in showing that we got it right, the family um, was absolutely uh, decisive. Um, we, after we got the diagnosis, worked hard to find additional patients to confirm that we had it right. Uh, but the family um, had been blogging about their experiences of trying to get a diagnosis for Bertrand for a long time. And they uh, discussed the candidate diagnosis that they received from Duke. Um, that led to a lot of families contacting them saying things like, you know, our child is a lot like uh, Bertrand and, in fact, doesn't make tears when he or she cries. And the Mite family uh, really brokered a lot of relationships for those families to go out and see 
uh, researchers that knew about this and were prepared to test N glycanase for them, and they found more confirmation cases than anyone else did. And this whole story and the really critical role of the family uh, is uh, described in a really nice article um, in The New Yorker, uh, which is shown here if anyone is interested to read about that. Uh, so I think that really does strongly indicate that genetics really is working. I don't want to suggest that there aren't going to be challenges going forward. Uh, I'll say something more about some of the challenges in a minute. Uh, but I think that there really is no question that this kind of genetics really, truly is working. And the point I want to make now is that it is not only working, uh, but there are often uh, quite dramatic therapeutic implications. Now, when I say often, what I, mean, what, what I mean by often is maybe a percent or two of the time. When you get a, a clear genetic diagnosis, it really matters therapeutically. Now, to me, that is often because it means that a non-negligible proportion of these cases, we can do something really, really helpful. Uh, you will also see other estimates of the proportion of time that a whole exome sequencing-based diagnostic matters clinically, sometimes with estimates ranging up to 50% of the time. In my view, that uses an unhelpfully liberal definition of what it means to do something clinically useful. It, it is often the case that the families really do care to know. I believe in that, um, but I don't want to classify that as changing management. I want to focus on changing management when we really make a, a clinically meaningful difference. And I'm going to tell you a, about a couple of examples where I believe that has indeed happened. The first example uh, uh, is based upon a gene that has been implicated in two types of epilepsy. The gene is KCNT1, encoding a potassium channel. And it has been implicated in autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, which is a not so good, but not so awful epilepsy. And it has also been um, implicated uh, in malignant migrating uh, seizures of infancy. The old name of that condition is, is on the screen. And this is a really, really terrible epilepsy. And the Petri lab has been able to show that all of the mutations that cause epilepsy in this gene are gain of function mutations. So when you express this ion channel in an oocyte, um, all the mutations result in a substantially increased current in this oocyte model. In particular, the mutations that cause the really bad epilepsy have an approximately six or more fold increase in current, and the mutations that cause the not so bad epilepsy have perhaps a three fold increase in current over the wild type. So what we see here is that all mutations are gain of function, all of them result in an increase in current, and there is a clear genotype-phenotype correlation. More important than all of that is that Steve was also able to show that all of the mutations studied, all of them without exception, are sensitive to the FDA-approved drug quinidine. Um, this drug is already known to bind this channel, which is why uh, Steve decided to try it. And he was able to show that without exception, the increased current is reduced for each and every one of these mutations by quinidine. Now, one point that I would like to emphasize is that quinidine is not a drug that you would ever give to an epilepsy patient if you didn't know about KCNT1. It is not an anti-epileptic -epile drug. And indeed, uh, you would certainly get in trouble uh, for giving a, a, a patient quinidine without good reason to do so. These functional data, however, give us very good reason to consider quinidine in patients that have uncontrolled seizures and, critically, that have KCNT1 mutation because you, as I said, would not otherwise want to give epilepsy patients quinidine. So we and others have been considering this as a therapy for patients where we are confident that, that KCNT1 is responsible. And we have two patients that have uh, emerged from the uh, diagnostic sequencing at Duke. Uh, these patients are being um, managed uh, by Mohammed Makati um, and Yangwei Jang and others uh, here at Duke. Uh, a little bit about each of the patients uh, uh, is provided here on the slide. I do want to emphasize that before we consider giving these patients quinidine, we did show with Steve uh, that both of the mutations are indeed quinidine sensitive. In these early stages of such targeted therapies, I think that that's impor important to do. 
and we then uh, uh, initiated a quinidine treatment for these patients. And what we found is that um, the seizure burden was reduced uh, very shortly after the administration of quinidine in both patients. It was reduced, but in fact, neither patient achieved seizure freedom. In one patient in particular, we do believe uh, that there was a clear response. The other patient's a little bit less clear. Uh, but there was a paper published uh, by a group at CHOP uh, that showed that their patient, KCNT1 positive patient, um, in fact, achieved seizure freedom after the initiation of quinidine. So this, I think, uh, clearly illustrates the potential for targeted therapies. Uh, I think we do see collectively uh, that quinidine can help in these patients. Uh, it is most certainly appropriate to call this precision uh, medicine because, as I said, you would never otherwise give patients quinidine. But a couple of cautionary notes are, number one, I'm personally convinced that even for the KCNT1 positive patients, quinidine won't be what we will be using long term. I think that we are seeing encouraging results that we are getting some increased seizure control with quinidine, but quinidine actually doesn't get into the brain very well. And what that means is you've got to increase the dose in order to get into the brain. That raises uh, concerns about uh, cardiotoxicity. Uh, and so I think it's pretty clear that quinidine gives us a therapeutic direction, uh, but not the actual compound that we're going to ultimately be using in KCNT1 patients. The other cautionary note is that you have to really be sure uh, that uh, the mutation that you're looking at in KCNT1 is actually contributing to disease. And this is going to be a major challenge for the field of precision medicine going forward that I believe is really not sufficiently appreciated. Um, when we look at a particular gene that is already implicated in disease, and we think we see a mutation that is contributing to disease in an individual patient, we are very often wrong. That is a much harder problem than asking the question of whether the gene is involved in disease as a whole in, 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 in the group of patients with disease. It's much more difficult to say this mutation is, is contributing in this patient. And so here's one um, example of that kind of concern from our own work. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, we are watching for KCNT1 positive patients here at Duke. One patient that was ex exome sequenced uh, at Duke came back from the clinical lab with a variant identified in KCNT1 <clears throat> that was uh, suggested to be possibly pathogenic, possibly contributing to the patient's seizures. But the uh, lab did note that they only had the mother to look at, not the father, <clears throat> and that the variant might have simply been inherited from, from the father. So, of course, before we uh, considered initiating this patient on, um, on, uh, on quinidine, uh, we wanted to assess whether the variant really is pathogenic. So we looked in individuals that we have sequenced in my own center here at Duke and <clears throat> looked to see where we, where we found the variant. And this plot shows a principal component representation of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of um, individuals of European and Middle Eastern ancestry that we have sequenced. And uh, what is also shown in the yellow circles are individuals that self-declare as having Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And so what you see here is the well-known cluster in principal component space of individuals with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. We've also indicated in the triangles the individuals that carry that exact variant in KCNT1 that came back from the clinical lab. And what you can see very, very clearly as soon as you look at the data this way is that that variant is, in fact, an Ashkenazi Jewish polymorphism. It is most certainly not contributing uh, to the patient's epilepsy. It is quite incidental to their epilepsy, and you most certainly would not want to give this particular patient quinidine. So I think this is a really important cautionary note that whenever we are doing this kind of precision therapeutics, we really need to be very, very careful uh, that we um, know what variants are contributing to disease in the individual patients. 
the final therapeutic implication story that I want to convey um, is, is in many ways the most satisfying of all that I've been involved in. Uh, a patient came uh, to the clinic at, at Duke uh, because of a, a, a progressive uh, neurological condition. She was doing okay up to around 18 months and then uh, really started suffering a broad range of different symptoms. Uh, some of them are indicated uh, uh, on the slide. It was highly progressive, and the clinical team really simply did not know what she had. Um, but they did come to the view that it could possibly be an autoimmune condition, but they were far from sure. But because they thought it could be, uh, they decided to um, treat aggressively on the basis of a possible autoimmune condition. Uh, but they also came to us and said, because we're not sure of the diagnosis, we would really appreciate it if you could sequence uh, this patient just as quickly as you can in case you could get a diagnosis that would change the course of management. And it really is very progressive, so we really would appreciate it if you could do it just as fast as possible. So normally it takes uh, a, a trio uh, with an undiagnosed disease for the proband. To, uh, it takes normally about three months. Uh, to go through our whole system of, of sequencing and bioinformatics and then eventual interpretation. And in this case, uh, we um, completed the analyses in around 20 days. And what we found is that the child is a compound heterozygote for loss of function mutations in a gene called SLC52A2. Uh, one of these uh, mutations is a missense mutation that had previously been reported as pathogenic for a disease called Brown uh, Violetta von Lehr syndrome 2, type 2. And the other was a stop gain uh, mutation sitting right in the middle uh, of the protein. Um, and since loss of function mutations are known to be responsible for this uh, rare disease, we felt pretty sure that this, in fact, um, is what the child has. And most importantly, uh, that gene actually encodes a riboflavin transporter. And the very, very rare disease that mutations in this gene cause, that disease is actually treated by supplementation with vitamin B. And it's hard to imagine a safer therapy than supplementation with vitamin B. Now, critically, not only is this rare disease treated with vitamin B supplementation, the literature also makes clear that the earlier you initiate therapy, the better the patient does. And so while we had just gotten the diagnosis, when we found out what it was, we all felt very, very strongly that vitamin B supplementation needed to be initiated in this patient as quickly as possible. Uh, so this shows the timeline. Uh, <clears throat> around 20 days after we got the bloods into the lab, we got the, uh, the putative diagnosis. And we, <clears throat> we had a frenzied period of uh, telephone calls and emails and discussions with IRB. And uh, three days after the diagnosis, the patient family came into the clinic. Um, the diagnosis was communicated to them, and uh, a, subscription, a prescription for vitamin B was written uh, by the clinician that managed this work and also worked on the uh, diagnostics with us, Vandana Shashi, here at Duke, a long-term uh, partner in this, in this area for us. Um, after Vandana wrote the prescription, uh, the patient's mother actually opened up the vitamin B bottle and gave uh, her daughter vitamin B in the lobby of the hospital. Uh, of course, with complete permissions, I show here uh, Kara, who was uh, treated for this rare disorder with vitamin B. Uh, this disorder makes it difficult to lift your arms. Uh, it results in very poor head control, ex excessive drooling, and a variety of other things. Um, at the top left, you see a picture of uh, Kara uh, before the initiation of therapy, um, sorry, uh, immediately after the initiation of therapy, and then you see pictures progressively through the course of therapy, and you can see the clear improvement in head control. And what I can tell you is that just a few weeks ago, uh, several of us uh, involved in this work uh, met Kara and her family, uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, it's difficult for patients to lift their arms when they have this condition. Um, and patients that are initiated early do uh, much better than those that are not. Uh, when we saw her a few weeks ago, she was running through the room, high-fiving everybody there. And I can tell you there really is hardly anything that you can do in genetics that makes you feel better than seeing something like that. 
So in part because of the recognition uh, that we really can make a clinical difference uh, when we get genetic diagnoses, and in part because we recognize that this is hard to do well because we need to be right as often as we possibly can in individual patients. Uh, what we have done is uh, put together an effort together with the epilepsy charity CURE uh, to try to pull together sequence data for patients with epilepsy that have been clinically sequenced into a central repository so that we can regularly reanalyze uh, these clinically sequenced uh, exomes to see first whether the clinical labs got it right, whether we agree, uh, but also to be able to reanalyze so that as new genes are discovered in the future, we can be sure that an, an individual exome that's been sequenced, say, a couple years ago is reanalyzed because maybe there's now a new gene found and that the individual patient that you sequenced a couple years ago has a mutation in that very gene. And you missed it a few years ago because the gene wasn't known, but you'd find it now. So we want to make sure that happens. And so we put together this um, initiative with CURE called the Epilepsy Genetic Initiative, or EGI. And one novel feature of this is that this repository is actually managed by CURE, and they intend to do this for the long haul. So we hope that this will be the creation, really, of a permanent resource for um, reviewing exomes and genomes, eventually, that are clinically sequenced. Um, this is just a, a slide indicating the sites that will be participating in the epilepsy genetics uh, uh, initiative, um, and we hope to expand upon that over time. So finally, my last comment in the last minute or two is that um, <clears throat> this kind of genetics is clearly really working. There are some uh, challenges that we face related to the uh, genetics. In particular, as I uh, have indicated as I went along, the challenge of getting the diagnostic uh, result right, as right as we possibly can in individual patients. Uh, but another challenge we face is that we are finding a great many mutations. And in order to uh, therapeutically capitalize on these discoveries, we really need to be able to <clears throat> model the effects of these mutations in laboratory settings. And the reason we need to be able to do that is we need to be able to screen for quinidine-like examples. Okay, the patient has this mutation. I study it in the lab. I show that in the lab. <clears throat> we can undo the effects of the mutation with drug X. We bring drug X back to the patient. That's exactly what was done in the quinidine example. Problem is, that it's a minority of the genes that carry mutations that we can simply put into an oocyte and study that way. That system is too simple for representing the effects of a lot of the mutations. We can't study the effect of, uh, <coughs> of uh, DNM1 on, <coughs> excuse me, on synaptic vesicle trafficking in the oocyte because it doesn't make synaptic vesicles. So that would be difficult to do. So we clearly need some generalizable framework for modeling the effects of mutations. And I would just like to suggest that one interesting generalizable framework is the use of multi-electrode arrays to monitor in vitro neuronal networks. And the basic idea here is that neurons in culture do form real connections. They do form neuronal networks that synchronize. So the action potentials that occur occur in a coordinated way through the network over time. And we most certainly can study the effects of mutations on these in vitro neuronal networks. Now, of course, we need to see whether the responsiveness of any features that we identify in these neuronal networks in vitro to particular compounds predicts the responsiveness of patients to those compounds that we need to assess. But there is reason to believe that we can get phenotypes for mutations out of these kinds of neuronal networks, and that just like the quinidine example, but in a more complex setting, we can then test for compounds that work in this in vitro model and then bring them back to the patient. And this next slide just shows that, in principle, we think this ought to work. What I'm actually showing you are results for a mouse model of the most common mutation responsible for alternating hemiplegia of childhood, which you heard about earlier. We showed that the ATP1A3 gene is responsible for this condition. 
mutations at the 801 site are the most important uh, contributor within this gene. And what you actually see <coughs> on the left-hand side <coughs> here is one of the features of neuronal networks that are based on neurons taken from wild-type mouse pups, and that's shown in red, and also for mutant mouse pups. And here, this is a, <coughs> a mutant model that was generated by Mohamed Makati. And what you can clearly see is that as you look at the days in vitro, so that's just the number of days since you took the cells out of the mouse, um, <coughs> over, as the number of days increase, you get an increasing separation in the, num in the percentage of all the spikes that are observed, those are action potentials, all the spikes that are observed and recorded <coughs> by the multi-electrode array system, you see an increasing difference in the number between the, the wild type in red and the, um, and the mutant in black. So what this means is that in this model, the mutant is associated with more of all the action potentials that are occurring in this um, <coughs> neural network occurring in network spikes when you see action potentials occurring all at the same time. <coughs> so what we see is that this is a more coordinated, more synchronized neuronal network in vitro um, from the mouse mutant model compared to wild type. That is actually a hallmark of excitability mutations. And in fact, what we're going to do now, of course, is start testing drugs to see if we can push the wild type back, uh, sorry, push the mutant back towards the wild type. And if we can find such drugs, uh, then of course, those become candidates for uh, bringing back to the patient. So that's it, <clears throat> um, and I'd just like to acknowledge anybody that I didn't acknowledge as I went along. Uh, hopefully they are on the slide, but I would like to draw particular attention to the NINDS support for Epi4K, uh, a lot, which uh, was the basis of a lot of what I described, and, and in particular our uh, program officers uh, at uh, NINDS who really have not only helped administer the award well, uh, but have provided tremendous scientific guidance uh, as we went through. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, who's listening as well. Thank you. So, Dr. Goldstein, we do have a few questions in the chat room. Uh, the first question is, how do the de novo mutations identified in the epilepsy trio break down by variant type, uh, SNP, CNV, other? If CNVs, what was the minimum size detected? and the minimum size that appear to have any effect. Uh, and uh, curious to hear your thoughts on how CNVs may affect disease. Um, so most of the uh, pathogenic uh, de novo mutations uh, that we've identified are uh, point mutations, and most of those are, in fact, missense mutations. Um, as far as uh, copy number variants go, uh, these actually have been studied uh, as part of this effort using the whole exome sequence data uh, by Evan Eichler uh, and, and Heather Mefford's uh, groups. Uh, we don't actually find in our cohort a lot of uh, putatively pathogenic uh, uh, copy number variants. This is in part actually because there have been some clinical screening of copy number variants in, in our cohort before we did the exome sequencing, just as part of, of clinical management. And any individual's positive findings were, were in fact, not, not included. Uh, so we're not able to make a good assessment of the contribution of copy number variants in this particular cohort for that reason. Uh, but uh, our impression uh, is very much that um, it is uh, a minority, a, 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 a small minority. Exactly what it is would be hard to say. But I, I would guess probably less than, than 10 percent uh, of the overall uh, group of patients with these conditions. Another question for you uh, is, how can we speed up the testing of these mutations to get to understanding of a potential therapeutic intervention? So this is a good question. And the, I think for these kinds of diagnostics that I've been talking about here, um, the key to speeding up the process is getting insurers on board with it being worth paying for. And as far as I'm concerned, that is really, really clear. It is worth paying for as long as you use the exome sequence well, um, do a good job of, um, of interpretation. Um, it would certainly be 
harmful, uh, in fact, to the overall clinical enterprise if we generally did a bad job of interpreting the genomes because it would lead us in, in a whole bunch of wrong directions. Um, but I think it is clearly uh, worth it um, if we do a good job, and, and that is really the single biggest impediment right now to systematic deployment. It's that it's hard to get insurers to pay for it. Definitely something that we're all working on, uh, trying to help those insurers realize the the um, increase in in cost savings uh, for for them and also the benefit to the patients. Uh, and I think we have time for just one last question because we're coming really close to the top of the hour here. Uh, but the last question is, uh, which step do you think is the greatest source of technical variability, sampling populations, clinical sequencing, library standardization, or data mining? Uh, it's a great question, and I and I think that the uh, I, I do have I do have an answer, but I think I'd I'd be hard pressed to sort of prove that it's right. Um, but I, I think the the greatest source of variability right now um, that influences getting the answer right or wrong um, it is in fact the final judgment about whether a particular variant is pathogenic, and I think the fundamental reason for that is that there are um, variants in the databases um, that are annotated as causing disease that do not cause disease. And we all know that, but the problem is actually worse than that in that the variants that are in databases annotated as causing disease that do not cause disease, they are clearly more common in the general population than the variants that really cause disease. That means we very often bump into the wrong variant, um, and bump into a variant that, that, is, that isn't causal. Uh, I actually think that's probably our single biggest challenge right now, and the single biggest source of getting it wrong. I'd like to, again, thank Dr. Goldstein uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you have any questions or specifics, you can go to our webpage or contact your local TAM or uh, field service uh, representative. So thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Thanks a lot.